After the war, the Japanese National Railways, JNR, faced the challenge of meeting the rapidly increasing transportation demand on the Takedo Main Line due to economic recovery. There were ongoing discussions on whether to adopt quadruple tracking or the broad gauge new line plan that existed before the war. Meanwhile, in Europe and the United States, automobiles and airplanes had already begun to dominate passenger transportation, and railways were considered a declining industry, seeking survival in freight transportation. Amidst a pessimistic atmosphere about the future of railways, JNR judged that high-speed rail was optimal in Japan, where the spread of automobiles and airplanes was not expected for the time being. Various technological developments were pursued to materialize the pre-war bullet train plan, which envisioned operations at 200 km per hour. Overseas, railway speed records had exceeded 200 km per hour since before the war, with even diesel and steam trains setting records over 200 km per hour. In terms of vehicle power performance, the era had already seen the prospect of exceeding 200 km per hour. However, these were all single-run tests, and the operational speed had long been unable to break the 100 mile per hour barrier. Except for the South Manchuria Railway, JNR had only accumulated narrow-gauge technology. To utilize the rapidly advancing electric train technology, speed improvement tests were conducted using newly developed electric trains one after another. Following the 90 series commuter train with a changed reduction ratio, speed improvement tests were conducted even with the Odak USE train, which had an articulated structure and ultra-lightweight body. Furthermore, with the birth of the 20 series Kodama type, JNR challenged the world of 160 km per hour at once. Although the running performance and stability of the vehicles were promising in these tests, achieving the unprecedented 200 km per hour commercial operation worldwide required more than just vehicle power performance. Many new technologies that changed the conventional wisdom of railways were developed and put into practical use, such as a new signal communication system that did not rely on visual ground signals, and a track system aimed at high-speed stable running and reduced maintenance. Another challenge was the power collection using overhead wires and pantographs. At that time, continuous high-speed operation with internal combustion vehicles was not realistic, and electric operation was considered essential. Technological developments progressed to ensure stable power collection without the overhead wires and pantographs separating even at high speeds. One of the factors that made these series of technological developments possible was the environment that gathered highly skilled engineers. The Navy, which had a rare function as a group of engineers before the war, and the shipbuilding industry and JNR took on the role of re-employing these technical personnel after military and aviation technology development was banned by the occupying forces. The Shinkansen, as a comprehensive technology that brought together these technologies, realized the unprecedented Shinkansen, where trains operating at a commercial speed of 210 km per hour ran in large numbers as if they were commuter trains. This success completely changed the world's view of railways. On the other hand, behind the glamorous success of the Shinkansen, there were steady efforts supporting it. Among these, the 911 series diesel locomotive is interesting from a vehicle perspective. Why did a diesel locomotive appear on the fully electrified Shinkansen line? There were reasons that required diesel, such as track maintenance and rescuing stranded vehicles. First, for hauling construction freight cars, a standard gauge converted DD-13 was introduced. Furthermore, in 1964, the Type 941 rescue vehicle was created to deliver emergency materials to sites where trains had broken down. This was a modification of the two-car set known as the A-set from the prototype formation. Even though it was a two-car train, it had a class of 2,000 horsepower. Even if materials were delivered quickly, the reduction ratio designed for 200 km per hour made it impossible to haul and move stranded trains. Naturally, there was the weakness of being unable to move if there was a power outage. Therefore, there was a demand for high-output diesel locomotives capable of high-speed operation, even under power outages. Since the Shinkansen was planned to have 16 car formations in the future, the performance to haul a failed 16-car train was required. 
In a 16-car formation, the loaded weight reached 960 tons, and with a 20 per mil gradient at Sekigahara, the performance to pull out a stranded train there was necessary. If there had been the technology to produce 4,000 horsepower class diesel locomotives like in Europe and the United States, it would have been ideal. However, at that time, the DD-51 was just entering mass production. It was not feasible to expect high-output diesel locomotives of this class. Moreover, even though it was the Shinkansen, the tracks designed for EMUs did not allow axle loads exceeding 20 tons like in Europe and the United States. To achieve a rescue diesel locomotive with a 16-ton axle load using domestic technology, there was no choice but to utilize the power unit of the DD-51. However, simply converting the gauge of the DD-51 was insufficient in terms of adhesion performance to haul heavy trains on a 20 per mil gradient. Additionally, with a maximum speed of 95 km per hour, it would take a long time to reach the rescue site. Therefore, a new development added a gear-switching mechanism for low and high speeds to the hydraulic transmission for the first time and increased the capacity of the transmission oil cooler. In the high-speed mode, it was designed to reach 160 km per hour even with the driving wheels worn down to 830 mm, reducing the time to reach the site. Although the low-speed mode only reached 92 km per hour, combined with the three-speed switching function of the hydraulic transmission, it could generate high tractive effort at low speeds. Of course, switching between high-speed and low-speed modes could only be done while stationary. When heading for rescue, it was planned to run solo in high-speed mode and haul the failed train in low-speed mode. Additionally, it was assigned the task of hauling track inspection cars and monitoring track conditions, essentially making it the predecessor of Dr. Yellow, where the high-speed mode demonstrated its effectiveness. To ensure sufficient adhesion, which was lacking in the DD-51, the drive axles were configured as six axles, all of which were directly connected as driving axles. To further enhance adhesion performance, improvements were also made to the engine notch control. In the DD-51, the two engines were simultaneously controlled in 14 steps, but in the 911 series, each engine was controlled individually. While the first notch was the same for both engines, a circuit was added to notch up alternately by one notch each, resulting in a very fine 27-notch output control. This, combined with the shock-absorbing effect of the hydraulic transmission, made the changes in tractive effort at the driving wheels very smooth. At that time, the high adhesion performance of phase-controlled AC electric locomotives was attracting attention, but the 911 series achieved a high adhesion coefficient of 0.35, nearly matching this. The driver's cab was similar to that of Shinkansen EMUs, equipped with ATC, and additional handles, indicator lights, and instruments specific to diesel locomotives. The master controller was completely different from that of the DD-51, with only six positions, notch advance, automatic notch advance, neutral, notch return, and off, with commands sent via pulse signals. The 911 series, developed by gathering the best of JNR's diesel vehicle technology at the time, boasted a practical operating speed of 160 km per hour, making it the world's fastest internal combustion vehicle at that time. In emergencies on conventional lines, steam and diesel locomotives scattered around could be gathered for rescue, but this was not possible in the isolated world of the Shinkansen. In addition to rescue EMUs, rescue locomotives were prepared to handle any accidents or breakdowns that might occur. On the other hand, the Shinkansen has been performing excellently, with no major accidents and no long-term stranding requiring rescue. It has been evaluated as the safest railway in the world, fully demonstrating the advantages of railways in terms of transportation capacity, accuracy, and stability. As a result, the rescue vehicles developed behind the scenes had no opportunity to be active. Although a nationwide Shinkansen network has not yet been realized, the extension of Shinkansen lines has significantly increased, while the gradual aging of facilities has become a problem.
Despite having miraculously survived several major earthquakes without casualties, the likelihood of serious stranding has increased since the initial opening. Although there are attempts to provide short-distance self-propulsion functions using storage batteries, the current situation is that there is a sense of insecurity due to the lack of measures against power outage-related disruptions.